Section 55 of Volume 1A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1A section fifty five appendix two part three the first branch of the king's stated revenue was the royal domain or crown lands which were very extensive and comprehended besides a great number of manors most of the chief cities of the kingdom it was established by law that the king could alienate no part of his domain and that he himself or his successor could at any time resume such donations but this law was never regularly observed which happily rendered in time the crown somewhat more dependent the rent of the crown lands considered merely as so much riches was a source of power the influence of the king over his tenants and the inhabitants of his towns increased this power but the other numerous branches of his revenue besides supplying his treasury gave by their very nature a great latitude to arbitrary authority and were a support of the prerogative as will appear from an enumeration of them the king was never content with the stated rents but levied heavy tallages at pleasure on the inhabitants both of town and country who lived within his domain all bargains of sale in order to prevent theft being prohibited except in boroughs and public markets he pretended to exact tolls on all goods whist were there sold he seized two hogsheads one before and one behind the mast from every vessel that imported wine all goods paid to his customs a proportional part of their value passage over bridges and on rivers was loaded with tolls at pleasure and though the boroughs by degree bought the liberty of farming these impositions yet the revenue profited by these bargains new sums were often exacted for the renewal and confirmation of their charters and the people were thus held in perpetual dependence such was the situation of the inhabitants within the royal domains but the possessors of land or the military tenants though they were better protected both by law and by the great privilege of carrying arms were from the nature of their tenures much exposed to the inroads of power and possessed not what we should esteem in our age a very durable security the conqueror ordained that the barons should be obliged to pay nothing beyond their stated services except a reasonable aid to ransom his person if he were taken in war to make his eldest son a knight and to marry his eldest daughter what should on these occasions be deemed a reasonable aid was not determined and the demands of the crown were so far discretionary the king could require in war the personal attendance of his vassals that is of almost all the landed proprietors and if they declined the service they were obliged to pay him a composition in money which was called a scutage the sum was during some reigns precarious and uncertain it was sometimes levied without allowing the vassal the liberty of personal service and it was a usual artifice of the king's to pretend an expedition that he might be entitled to level scutage from his military tenants danegelt was another species of land tax levied by the early norman kings arbitrarily and contrary to the laws of the conqueror moneyage was also a general land tax of the same nature levied by the two first norman kings and abolished by the charter of henry i it was a shilling paid every three years by each hearth to induce the king not to use his prerogative in debasing the coin indeed it appears from that charter that though the conqueror had granted his military tenants an immunity from all taxes and tallages he and his son william had never thought themselves bound to observe that rule but had levied impositions at pleasure on all landed estates of the kingdom the utmost that henry grants is that the land cultivated by the military tenant himself shall not be so burdened 
but he reserves the power of taxing the farmers, and it is known that Henry Charter was never observed in any one article. We may be assured that this prince and his successors retracted even this small indulgence and levied arbitrarily impositions on all the lands of all their subjects. These taxes were sometimes very heavy, since Malmesby tells us that in the reign of William Rufus, the farmers, on account of them, abandoned tillage and a famine ensued. The escheats were a great branch both of power and of revenue, especially during the first reigns after the conquest. In default of posterity, from the first baron, his land reverted to the crown and continually augmented the king's possessions. The prince had indeed by law a power of alienating these escheats, but by this means he had an opportunity of establishing the fortunes of his friends and servants, and thereby enlarging his authority. Sometimes he retained them in his own hands, and they were gradually confounded with the royal domains, and became difficult to be distinguished from them. This confusion is probably the reason why the king acquired the right of alienating his domains. But besides escheats from default of heirs, those which ensued from crimes or breach of duty towards the superior lord were frequent in ancient times. If the vassal, being thrice summoned to attend his superior's court and do fealty, neglected or refused obedience, he forfeited all title to his land. If he denied his tenure or refused his service, he was exposed to the same penalty. If he sold his estate without license from his lord, or if he sold it upon any other tenure or title than by which he himself held it, he lost all right to it. The adhering to his lord's enemies, deserting him in war, betraying his secrets, debauching his wife or his near relations, or even using indecent freedoms with them, might be punished by forfeiture. The higher crimes, rapes, robbery, murder, arson, etc., were called felony, and being interpreted want of fidelity to his lord, made him lose his fief. Even where the felon was vassal to a baron, though his immediate lord enjoyed the forfeiture, the king might retain possession of his estates during a twelvemonth, and had the right of spoiling and destroying it, unless the baron paid him a reasonable composition. We have not here enumerated all the species of felonies or of crimes by which the forfeiture was incurred. We have said enough to prove that the possession of feudal property was anciently somewhat precarious, and that the primary idea was never lost of it being a kind of fee or benefice. When a baron died, the king immediately took possession of the estate, and the heir, before he recovered his right, was obliged to make application to the crown and desire that he might be admitted to do homage for his land and pay a composition to the king. This composition was not at first fixed by law, at least by practice. The king was often exorbitant in his demands and kept possession of the land till they were complied with. If the heir were a minor, the king retained the whole profit of the estate till his majority and might grant what sum he thought proper for the education and maintenance of the young baron. This practice was also founded on the notion that a fief was a benefice, and that, while the heir could not perform his military services, the revenue devolved to the superior, who employed another in his stead. It is obvious that a great proportion of the landed property must, by means of this device, be continually in the hands of the prince, and that all the noble familias were thereby held in perpetual dependence. When the king granted the wardship of a rich heir to any one, he had the opportunity of enriching a favorite or minister. If he sold it, he thereby levied a considerable sum of money. Simon de Montfort paid Henry the Third ten thousand marks, an immense sum in those days, for the wardship of Gilbert de Umfreville. Geoffrey de Mandeville paid to the same prince the sum of twenty thousand marks that he might marry Isabel, countess of Gloucester, and possess all her lands and knights' fees. This sum would be equivalent to three hundred thousand, perhaps four hundred thousand pounds in our time. 
if the heir were female the king was entitled to offer her any husband of her rank he thought proper and if she refused him she forfeited her land even a male heir could not marry without the royal consent and it was usual for men to pay large sums for the liberty of making their own choice in marriage no man could dispose of his land either by sale or will without the consent of his superior the possessor was never considered as full proprietor he was still a kind of beneficiary and could not oblige his superior to accept of any vassal that was not agreeable to him fines americaments and oblatas as they were called were another considerable branch of royal power and revenue the ancient records of the exchequer which are still preserved give surprising accounts of the numerous fines and americaments levied in those days and of the strange inventions fallen upon to exact money from the subject it appears that the ancient kings of england put themselves entirely on the footing of the barbarous eastern princes whom no man must approach without a present who sell all their good offices and who intrude themselves into every business that they may have a pretense for exhorting money even justice was avowedly bought and sold the king's court itself though the supreme judicature of the kingdom was open to none that brought not presents to the king the bribes given for the daily expedition delay suspension and doubtless for the perversion of justice were entered into the public registers of the royal revenue and remain as monuments of the perpetual iniquity and tyranny of the times the barons of the exchequer for instance the first nobility of the kingdom were not ashamed to insert as an article in their records that the county of norfolk paid a sum that they might be fairly dealt with the borough of yarmouth that the king's charters which they have for their liberties might not be violated richard son of gilbert for the king's helping him to recover his debt from the jews serlo son of Tervalston, that he might be permitted to make his defence in case he was accused of a certain homicide waiter de burton for free law if accused of wounding another robert de essert for having an inquest to find whether roger the butcher and wace and humphrey accused him of robbery and theft out of envy and ill-will or not william bewhurst for having an inquest to find whether he were accused of the death of one goodwin out of ill-will or for just cause i have selected these few instances from the great number of a like kind which maddox has selected from a still greater number preserved in the ancient rolls of the exchequer sometimes the party litigant offered the king a certain portion a half a third a fourth payable out of the debts which he as the executor of justice should assist him in recovering theophania de westland agreed to pay the half of two hundred and twelve marks that she might recover that sum against james de fugelson solomon the jew engaged to pay one mark out of every seven that he should recover against hugh de la hose nicholas morel promised to pay sixty pounds that the earl of flanders might be distrained to pay him three hundred and forty three pounds which the earl had taken from him and these sixty pounds were to be paid out of the first money that nicholas should recover from the earl as the king assumed the entire power over trade he was to be paid for a permission to exercise commerce or industry of any kind hugh oysel paid four hundred marks for liberty to trade in england nigel de haven gave fifty marks for the partnership in merchandise which he had with gervais de hanton the men of worcester paid one hundred shillings that they might have the liberty of selling and buying dyed cloth as formerly several other towns paid for a like liberty the commerce indeed of the kingdom was so much under the control of the king that he erected guilds corporations and monopolies wherever he pleased and levied sums for those exclusive privileges there were no profits so small as to be below the king's attention henry son of arthur gave ten dogs to have a recognition 
against the Countess of Copeland for one night's fee. Roger, son of Nicholas, gave twenty lampreys and twenty shads for an inquest to find whether Gilbert, son of Alarid, gave to Roger two hundred muttons to obtain his confirmation for certain lands, and whether Roger took them from him by violence. Geoffrey Fitzpierre, the royal justiciary, gave two good Norway hawks that Walter Lamandine might have leave to export a hundredweight of cheese out of the king's dominions. It is really amusing to remark the strange business in which the king sometimes interfered, and never without a present. The wife of Hugh de Neville gave the king two hundred hens that she might lie with her husband one night, and she brought with her two sureties, who answered each for a hundred hens. It is probable that her husband was a prisoner, which debarred her from having access to him. The abbot of Rockford paid ten marks for leave to erect houses and place men upon his land near Wellhung, in order to secure his wood there from being stolen. Hugh, archdeacon of Wells, gave one ton of wine for leave to carry six hundred sums of corn whither he would. Peter de Perales gave twenty marks for leave to salt fishes, as Peter Chevalier used to do. End of section 55. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Section 56 of Volume 1A of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1A, Section 56, Appendix 2, Part 4. It was usual to pay high fines in order to gain the king's good will or mitigate his anger. In the reign of Henry the Second, Gilbert, the son of Fergus, fines in nine hundred and nineteen pounds nine shillings to obtain that prince's favor. William de Chatain, a thousand marks, that he would remit his displeasure. In the reign of Henry the Third, the city of London fines in no less a sum than twenty thousand pounds on the same account. The king's protection and good offices of every kind were bought and sold. Robert Grisley paid twenty marks of silver that the king would help him against the Earl of Montaigne in a certain plea. Robert de Condé gave thirty marks of silver that the king would bring him to an accord with the Bishop of Lincoln. Ralph de Breckham gave a hawk that the king would protect him, and this is a very frequent reason for payments. John, son of Ordgar, gave a Norway hawk to have the king's request to the king of Norway to let him have his brother Goddard's chattels. Richard de Neville gave twenty palfreys to obtain the king's request to Isolde Bisset that she should take him for a husband. Robert Fitzwalter gave three good palfreys to have the king's letter to Roger Bertram's mother that she should marry him. Elling, the dean, paid one hundred marks that his whore and his children might be let out upon bail. The bishop of Winchester gave one ton of good wine for his not putting the king in mind to give a girdle to the countess of Arbermarle. Robert de Vaux gave five of the best palfreys that the king would hold his tongue about Henry Pennell's wife. There are, in the records of Exchequer, many other singular instances of a like nature. It will, however, be just to remark that the same ridiculous practices and dangerous abuses prevailed in Normandy and probably in all the other states of Europe. England was not in this respect more barbarous than its neighbors. These iniquitous practices of the Norman kings were so well known that on the death of Hugh Bigode, in the reign of Henry the Second, the best and most just of these princes, the eldest son and the widow of his nobleman came to court and strove by offering large presents to the king, each of them to acquire possession of that rich inheritance. The king was so equitable 
as to order the cause to be tried by the great council but in the meantime he seized all the money and treasure of the deceased peter of blois a judicious and even elegant writer for that age gives a pathetic description of the reign of henry and he scruples not to complain to the king himself of these abuses we may judge what the case would be under the government of worse princes the articles of inquiry concerning the conduct of sheriffs which henry promulgated in eleven seventy show the great power as well as the licentiousness of these officers americaments or fines for crimes and trespasses were another considerable branch of the royal revenue most crimes were atoned for by money the fines imposed were not limited by any rule or statute and frequently occasioned the total ruin of the person even for the slightest trespasses the forest laws particularly were a great source of oppression the king possessed sixty-eight forests thirteen chases and seven hundred and eighty-one parks in different parts of england and considering the extreme passion of the english and normans for hunting these were so many snares laid for the people by which they were allured into trespasses and brought within the reach of arbitrary and rigorous laws which the king had thought proper to enact by his own authority but the most barefaced acts of tyranny and oppression were practised against the jews who were entirely out of the protection of the law were extremely odious from the bigotry of the people and were abandoned to the immeasurable rapacity of the king and his ministers besides many other indignities to which they were continually exposed it appears that they were once all thrown into prison and the sum of sixty thousand marks extracted for their liberty at another time isaac the jew paid alone five thousand one hundred marks brim three thousand marks jernet two thousand bennet five hundred at another the corsia widow of david the jew of oxford was required to pay six thousand marks and she was delivered over to six of the richest and discreetest jews in england who were to answer for the sum henry the third borrowed five thousand marks from the earl of cornwall and for his repayment consigned over to him all the jews in england the revenue arising from exactions upon this nation was so considerable that there was a particular court of exchequer set apart for managing it we may judge concerning the low state of commerce among the english when the jews notwithstanding these oppressions could still find their account in trading among them and lending them money and as the improvements of agriculture were also much checked by the immense possessions of the nobility by the disorders of the time and by the precarious state of feudal property it appears that industry of no kind could then have a place in the kingdom it is asserted by sir harry spellman as an undoubted truth that during the reigns of the first norman princes every edict of the king issued with the consent of his privy council had the full force of law but the barons surely were not so passive as to entrust a power entirely arbitrary and despotic into the hands of the sovereign it only appears that the constitution had not fixed any precise boundaries to the royal power that the right of issuing proclamations on any emergence and of exacting obedience to them a right which is always supposed inherent in the crown is very difficult to be distinguished from a legislative authority that the extreme imperfection of the ancient laws and the sudden exigencies which often occurred in such turbulent governments obliged the prince to exert frequently the latent powers of his prerogative that he naturally proceeded from the acquiescence of the people to assume in many particulars of moment an authority from which he had excluded himself by express statutes charters or concessions and which was in the main repugnant to the general genius of the constitution and that the lives the personal liberty and the property of all his subjects were less secured by the law against the exertion of his arbitrary authority than by the independent power and private connections of each individual it appears from the great charter itself that not only john a tyrannical prince and richard a violent one 
but their father henry under whose reign the prevalence of gross abuses is the least to be suspected were accustomed from their sole authority without process of law to imprison banish and attaint the freemen of their kingdom a great baron in ancient times considered himself as a kind of sovereign within his territory and was attended by courtiers and dependents more zealously attached to him than the ministers of state and the great officers were commonly to their sovereign he often maintained in his court the parade of royalty by establishing a justiciary constable marshal chamberlain seneschal and chancellor and assigning to each of these officers a separate province and command he was usually very assiduous in exercising his jurisdiction and took such delight in that image of sovereignty that it was found necessary to restrain his activity and prohibit him by law from holding courts too frequently it is not to be doubted but the example set him by the prince of a mercenary and sordid extortion would be faithfully copied and that all his good and bad offices his justice and injustice were equally put to sale he had the power with the king's consent to exact tallages even from the free citizens who lived within his barony and as his necessities made him rapacious his authority was usually found to be more oppressive and tyrannical than that of the sovereign he was ever engaged in hereditary or personal animosities or confederacies with his neighbors and often gave protection to all desperate adventurers and criminals who could be useful in serving his violent purposes he was able alone in times of tranquillity to obstruct the execution of justice within his territories and by combining with a few malcontent barons of high rank and power he could throw the state into convulsions and on the whole though the royal authority was confined within bounds and often within very narrow ones yet the check was irregular and frequently the source of great disorders nor was it derived from the liberty of the people but from the military power of many petty tyrants who were equally dangerous to the prince and oppressive to the subject the power of the church was another rampart against royal authority but this defence was also the cause of many mischiefs and inconveniences the dignified clergy perhaps were not so prone to immediate violence as the barons but as they pretended to a total independence on the state and could always cover themselves with the appearances of religion they proved in one respect an obstruction to the settlement of the kingdom and to the regular execution of the laws the policy of the conqueror was in this particular liable to some exception he augmented the superstitious veneration for rome to which that age was so much inclined and he broke those bands of connection which in the saxon times had preserved a union between the lay and the clerical orders he prohibited the bishops from sitting in the county courts he allowed ecclesiastical causes to be tried in spiritual courts only and he so much exalted the power of the clergy that of sixty thousand two hundred and fifteen knights fees into which he divided england he placed no less than twenty eight thousand and fifteen under the church the right of primogeniture was introduced with the feudal law an institution which is hurtful by producing and maintaining an unequal division of private property but is advantageous in another respect by accustoming the people to a preference in favor of the eldest son and thereby preventing a partition or disputed succession in the monarchy the normans introduced the use of surnames which tend to preserve the knowledge of families and pedigrees they abolished none of the old absurd methods of trial by the cross or ordeal and they added a new absurdity the trial by single combat which became a regular part of jurisprudence and was conducted with all order method devotion and solemnity imaginable the ideas of chivalry also seem to have been imported by the normans no traces of those fantastic notions are to be found among the plain and rustic saxons the feudal institutions by raising the military tenants to a kind of sovereign dignity 
by rendering personal strength and valor requisite and by making every knight and baron his own protector and adventure begat that material pride and sense of honor which being cultivated and embellished by the poets and romance writers of the age ended in chivalry the virtuous knight fought not only in his own quarrel but in that of the innocent of the helpless and above all of the fair whom he supposed to be forever under the guardianship of his valiant arm the uncourteous knight who from his castle exercised robbery on travellers and committed violence on virgins was the object of his perpetual indignation and he put him to death without scruple or trial or appeal whenever he met with him the great independence of men made personal honor and fidelity the chief tie among them and rendered it the capital virtue of every true knight or genuine professor of chivalry the solemnities of single combat as established by law banished the notion of everything unfair or unequal in encounters and maintained an appearance of courtesy between the combatants till the moment of their engagement the credulity of the age grafted on this stock the notions of giants enchanters dragons spells and a thousand wonders which still multiplied during the times of the crusades when men returning from so great a distance used the liberty of imposing every fiction on their believing audience these ideas of chivalry infected the writings conversation and behavior of men during some ages and even after they were in a great measure banished by the revival of learning they left modern gallantry and the point of honor which still maintain their influence and are the genuine offspring of those ancient affectation the concession of the great charter or rather its full establishment for there was a considerable interval of time between the one and the other gave rise by degrees to a new species of government and introduced some order and justice into the administration the ensuing scenes of our history are therefore somewhat different from the preceding yet the great charter contained no establishment of new courts magistrates or senates nor abolition of the old it introduced no new distribution of the powers of the commonwealth and no innovation in the political or public law of the kingdom it only guarded and that merely by verbal clauses against such tyrannical practices as are incompatible with civilized government and if they become very frequent are incompatible with all government the barbarous license of the kings and perhaps of the nobles was thenceforth somewhat more restrained men acquired some more security for their property and their liberties and government approached a little nearer to that end for which it was originally instituted the distribution of justice and the equal protection of the citizens acts of violence and iniquity in the crown which before were only deemed injurious to individuals and were hazardous chiefly in proportion to the number power and dignity of the persons affected by them were now regarded in some degree as public injuries and as infringements of a charter calculated for general security and thus the establishment of the great charter without seeming any wise to innovate in the distribution of political power became a kind of epoch in the constitution end of section fifty six end of volume one a of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume recording by richard carpenter